So I've been sharing about um, going into the promised land. And we as a church, we're poised on the edge of our promised land. We've been in existence for 45 years. For 45 years, we've had a dream. A dream of a new church. A, a dream of a, a parking lot. <laughs> we've had a dream of, of being able to expand and uh, having something that uh, God has built. And we're right on the verge of it. We're just like on the river, the edge of the River Jordan. We can, all, we can see it right over there. But it's not just us as a church. It's also us individually. If God has given you a word, a dream, uh, a plan for your life, and you have not seen it come to pass yet, then your promised land is out there. And there are pitfalls we found as we started studying the children of Israel. There are pitfalls to actually moving in. Even though God had delivered miraculously the children of Israel out of Egypt, He brought them out with signs and wonders. And I mean, it was something nobody had ever seen before displayed himself with great and mighty power. And he had told them about this wonderful land that he was taking them to. He described it as a land that is flowing with milk and honey. And that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, there's rivers full of milk and honey dripping from all the trees, but it is a... Uh, it's kind of, uh, I suppose you would say, maybe a colloquial saying that they had in those days, one of abundance. A land of abundance. And they came from Egypt where they had to work. They were slaves. I mean, they came in at night. They were tired. And uh, they had bosses over them that were cruel. They owned, I don't know how much they owned of their own, uh, whether they owned land or, but they, they were slaves. They didn't know anything about abundance. And yet God is saying, I'm taking you there. So they had a promise from God. That's why we call that the promised land. Because God had promised them to take them in. But how many of them actually went in? All of the ones over 20 that had come out of Egypt had to die before they went in. And why did they? Because they succumbed to the, some of the pitfalls that we've been studying about that will keep you out of the promised land. And let me just make this statement. Just because God promised it doesn't mean it's going to come to pass unless you release your faith. Because according to the Bible, we found out what kept them out of the promised land. It was unbelief, period. It wasn't the giants. It wasn't the flooded rivers that kept them out of their promised land, it was unbelief. And so I want to um, kind of attack that this morning and give you a principle or a, something to believe for in order to not get into that place of unbelief. For us as a church and you individually. So I want to start with Numbers 14, verse 11, just um, to show you the mindset of God when he uh, realized that all this group of people, that he had worked so hard to get out of Egypt. Now, we, we, last time I ministered, we talked about murmuring and complaining, how that opened the door for the destroyer to come in and destroy them. 
And you know, that hurt God's heart. He intended for every single person to go into that promised land. And yet, they, what they did, their attitude was what kept them out of the promised land. So they murmured and complained. And then as they come up to the promised land, looking over into it, uh, I won't go into a lot of the details, but they sent out spies. The spies came back and says, oh my goodness, they are giants there. And uh, the children of Israel begin to mourn and cry, and uh, they begin to make negative confessions. And we'll look at that a little bit later. But in this verse of Scripture, we see how it affected God. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will this people provoke, spurn, and despise me? And how long will it be before they believe me, trusting in, relying on, clinging to me for all the signs which I performed among them? Leave that up there. So God is looking at all this unbelief, and he talks about uh, this little word called trust. Now, if I was going to put a title to my sermon this morning, it would be, Unbelief is a Trust Issue. So the children of Israel came out of Egypt, but they didn't know God enough to trust him. Now, there is a difference between faith and trust, a little bit of difference between faith and trust. They work together interchangeably, but there is a difference. Faith is believing God's word and standing on God's word. Trust is believing in God's character and trusting him. They work hand in hand. Uh, about 31 years ago, the Lord began to teach me about trust. And I, uh, this, this happened in 1991. It was actually early morning, 2 o'clock in the morning, on uh, October the 16th, 1991. Uh, we were sleeping soundly, and the phone rang. And when Pastor uh, Charlie answered the phone, I could tell something was wrong on the other end. And what was, uh, it was our son, Quentin, and he was calling to tell us that he was at the hospital with Tricia, which is my daughter-in-law, and they were getting ready to have their second child, which they had found out was going to be a girl. They had a boy already, and they had believed God for a girl. And so uh, Quentin said on the phone, uh, you guys need to pray. Because the doctor, Trish is in the hospital. The doctors have said the cord is wrapped around the baby's neck. And she was getting ready to be born. Well, uh, instantly, that released on the inside of me uh, uh, unnatural fear. Because not very many months before that, Kim had given birth to C.E. And during that process, the cord had wrapped around C.E.'s neck. And when he was, he was born just in the nick of time to keep him from, from being strangled to death. Thankfully, he wasn't. But he was as blue as he could be when he was born. And... Um, we were all praying, I mean, we were praying fervently. We were praying, we were, uh, you know, the doctors, his eyes were real big, and he was saying, pray, pray, pray. We, we knew him personally, and he had, he had said, you need to be here so you can pray if anything goes wrong. Well, something went wrong. So, uh, even though that turned out all right, still there was a fear there. And when I heard the cord was wrapped around Keeley's neck, I uh, immediately 
went into fear. Now, circumstances in our life can move us instantly into fear. And that always stops our faith. And I knew that. So I got up and I went down in the basement and I, I just made this purpose in my heart. I will not come out of this basement till I pray through. So I begin to pray and I begin to remind God, God, every day since I knew that Trisha was pregnant, I have prayed for this little child. I've pled the blood of Jesus over her. And I knew how devastated they would be if anything happened to her, how devastated we would be. And I said, Lord, I've pled the blood over her. And I kept praying, and I, I would pray, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I wasn't getting any peace. Finally, I didn't know what else to do, so I just stopped and listened. And then God spoke to me. And he said, don't you trust me? And of course, I said, well, of course I do, God. But then I got to thinking, what is trust? Do I really trust him? And that night, God began to teach me about trust. And I began to see a vision. I saw a vision of uh, the, the Black Canyon of the Gunnison. How many of you have ever been there? Has anybody ever been to that? Okay, I've heard a few say yes. It is uh, years ago when Quentin was like a toddler. Uh, Charlie and I took a vacation and went to, and we visited that black canyon of the, of the Gunnison. And it's, it's an amazing sight. It's a gorge that is so deep that the big river, the Gunnison River in the bottom of it, looks like just a tiny thread. Just a tiny silver thread. It's so, so, so far down there. And birds that fly around uh, in that canyon look like little tiny mosquitoes. And it's just, it's such a, a chasm that it, to me it just, it invoked fear in me just to look over. Because I knew that if you would fall over into that canyon, it would be, it would be a for sure death ride. But they had these, uh, these wooden fences around the edge. And uh, to, to keep people, I guess, from jumping off or from falling off. But I saw those fences, but there's no way that I would lean on that fence. Why didn't I lean on that fence? Because I did not trust that fence to hold me up. I knew that that fence was the only thing between me and death. And if I had trusted that fence, I would have put all my weight on it, no problem. But I didn't trust it. And as I saw that picture in my mind, I realized I understood a little bit more about what trust is. In uh, first, first Peter, uh, excuse me, First Timothy, I believe it's one nineteen, the Amplified gives us a little definition here of of trust and confidence. Uh, it's talking about holding fast to your faith, and that is the leaning of the entire human personality on God in absolute trust and confidence. So this is a definition, and I saw that that night or that early morning in the basement. I saw that picture of what trust really is. Trust is leaning your whole personality over on God, trusting him, trusting God in absolute confidence. See, the children of Israel, they knew his works, but they didn't know his ways. They didn't know God. 
and they couldn't trust God. So every time a problem arose, they murmured and complained instead of trusting God. So that night I said to the Lord, well, how do I go about trusting you? I did know God, but could I trust God? See, I, I, I was confronted with whether I could really trust God or not. And the only thing I knew to do was just to say, all right, God, I trust you. Lord, I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. And while I was saying that, I thought, you know, I could be in that hospital room with Tricia and Quentin, and there was still nothing I could do except pray and trust God. And I realized that night, I realized that when a situation is beyond your control, it is beyond your control. You're going to need supernatural help. And many times we take the responsibility of, of, of situations and we worry, we, we murmur, we complain, we talk about the negative just like the children of Israel, and we try to be our own God. Do you know we are seriously deficient in our ability to be God? I don't know if you know that or not. But there's times that we need supernatural help. Can you trust God in those times? Is God trustworthy? That's a question that we need to settle in our minds. Do we trust God? So... Um, that night, I realized that trusting God was the only place where we could have peace. And as after a little while of saying, I trust you, Lord, I trust you, Lord, I trust you, Lord, I started feeling peace come on me. The peace of God began to settle down upon me. And uh, eventually, I went upstairs, I went to bed, had got a good night's sleep. Quentin called the next morning, and he said, Oh, the, by the way, the doctor says everything's fine now. Can we trust God? Well, God came through for us. And Keely was born that next evening, October the 16th, 1991, perfect in every way. And today, she has four children, if I can, one, two, three, five children, excuse me. And she is a children's pastor at the, at the church that she goes to. Trusting God pays off. So in the Bible, the children of Israel had an issue. Their issue basically was a trust issue. Actually, in the New Testament, the disciples, when they were with Jesus in the boat in Mark, the fourth chapter, they were in the boat, and they, uh, and, and you know the story, I, I won't take time to go through that story, but the, there was a, a great wind came up, and a great storm came up, and water began to come into the boat, and they began to be afraid, the Bible tells us. And I'm going I'm to just turn there to Mark 4 because there's some things I want to bring out. The interesting thing about this is that Jesus was asleep in the boat. He was sound asleep in the middle of a storm. Now how could Jesus be that peaceful? Well, the same way that you and I can be peaceful in the middle of the storm if we have trust in our Father God and in the promises that he has given to us. So they were, uh, 
In the boat, uh, let me see where I want to start. Let's, I'm going to start in verse 37. And a furious storm of wind of hurricane proportions arose, and the waves kept beating into the boat so that it was already becoming full. Now, I can actually understand their fear. Now, I don't know how to swim. So when I am in a water situation, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not my friend. And in this situation, even though they were used to this, when they knew that if a boat was filled with water, it was going to sink. And they could see the circumstances begin to pile up, begin to pile up, begin to pile up. And uh, Jesus himself was in the stern of the boat, asleep on the leather cushion, and they awoke him and said to him, Now, I'm going to, I want you to pay attention to what they said to him. They said, Master, do you not care that we are perishing? Now, that very statement tells me they don't know Jesus very well. See, the devil tries to to tarnish God's reputation to us, to keep us from trusting him. He'll point out all the prayers that God didn't answer for you. Or maybe you just have lack of knowledge. But it contributes to not being able to trust the character of God. If we could go back to what the children of Israel said, Whenever they saw the giants or whatever came up, they kept saying this, God has brought us out into the wilderness to die. Now I want to ask you a question. Did God bring them out into the wilderness to die? Would God ever bring anybody out in the wilderness to die? It's not his character. And all the time that these disciples had been with Jesus, had they ever seen a time when Jesus didn't care? Over and over, he saw, they saw Jesus reaching out to people that were needy and meeting their needs, doing supernatural stuff. And yet... In this very time, in this very instance, they make this statement. Don't you, don't you care? They should have known the answer to that. Just like we should know the answer when something comes up in our lives and we need to depend on God. Does he care? He cares. Because that's his character. That's his nature to care. And if you know that he cares, then you can begin to have faith in his word. You know, there's one thing about somebody that has good character. They, a person that has good character is very careful to keep their word. I'm amazed at people that say, I will be here at a certain time, and they don't come. You know what that says? There's a little character flaw there. Now, sometimes you can't come, but you need to call. To keep your word. Is God a God that has as much character as he would demand out of us? God is a God that keeps his word. The Bible says he keeps covenant to a thousand generations. So if you have not seen an answer in your situation or someone else's situation, it, the, the blame does not rest with God. He will always keep his word. If we can just believe. That's the key. 
all things are possible if you can just believe. If God has spoken it, if you can believe, it is possible and he will do it. Now, God has given us a uh, promise that we as a church are standing on. I should have you tell me what it is, just to be sure you remember. Some of you don't know. The promise is, God says, I will pay for my church. Is he going to keep his word? Yes. He will. He's going to pay for his church. And you know what? He's going to use some of you to do it. And me. He's going to pay for his church. And he spoke to us that we would be so blessed that the blessings would overtake us so much that we could lend and not have to borrow. Is God faithful to his word? That's what we're believing. Joshua and Caleb stood up and said uh, to all these unbelieving people, Hey! If God is for us, these giants are going to be bred for us. If God is with us, and that's another sermon. If God is with us and God is for us, he's going to do it. And that's what Joshua and Caleb said. And you know what? Joshua and Caleb went into the promised land. Interesting thing about uh, when you get in a circumstance, the Bible is very clear that when the heat is on and the pressure starts to build, what is in your heart is going to come out. It's kind of like those pressure cookers. I used to, to can with a pressure cooker. I never really liked them because I thought they were a little dangerous. But you set them on, you know, you put your jars in it, and then you seal it all up. You put it on the heat. The heat begins to create pressure on the inside of the pressure cooker. Now, if you didn't have this little valve on the top that let the excess pressure escape, we would have an explosion. You have a little valve in your life, when the pressure starts building up, that little valve lets the, it's called a vent, it vents out your mouth. And what is in your heart is going to come out your mouth. And if you don't trust God, I can tell you what's going to come out your mouth. Murmuring and complaining or worry or fear-filled words are going to come out your mouth because that's what you've been meditating on, what you've been meditating on, what you've been putting in. The heat will begin to rise, and pretty soon you'll be saying things like, God brought us out into the wilderness to die. Oh, I'm just going to die. Or we, sh we, there's just, we can't meet these bills. We can't pay these bills. Um, you know, yeah, I've given. I know what Dean says in Maryland, but, but, you know, it doesn't work for me. Those kind of things start coming up. We know now when those things start coming out your mouth that there is an internal problem and it is a trust problem. You really don't know God very well. And you don't trust him and you're trying to be your own God. By the worry. Has worry ever done anything any good for anybody here? Raise your hand if it has. It's just wasted time. You know, if I'm going to if I'm going to do something that I'm not going to see any results from, why would I take time to do it? I would, rather, I would rather die in faith and trust 
than worry and complaining and murmuring. You're just less miserable when you trust God. And I found that out that night whenever I was praying for Keely. I mean, fear was gripping me. It's miserable to be in fear. It's miserable to worry. The minute I started trusting God was the minute I had peace. And I recognized peace is better than fear. Peace is better than worry. Trusting pays off. It pays to trust God. So the disciples recognized that, um, th or they, they had decided they were going to sink and die with Jesus in the boat. Now how stupid is that? I don't know if they'd seen him walk on water before this or after, but um, I can't imagine thinking that Jesus was going to die in a boat. But at the end, uh, verse, um, I don't, let me see where it's at in my Bible. I don't know if she has it back there pulled up, but verse 40, I'll just read this. He said to them, why are you, actually he stilled the storm. Uh, we know that. And it stopped just like that. Because many times we need supernatural help to stop our storm we can't do it without God and he said to them then after the storm there was perfect the Bible says there was perfect peacefulness after he and a great calm and he said to them why are you so timid and fearful listen to this how is it this is verse 40 how is it that you have no faith no firmly relying trust why is it that you don't have any trust? And you know what? They answered the question in that next verse. They were filled with great awe and feared exceedingly and said one to another, Who then is this that even wind and sea obey him? What they saying was, we really didn't know him very well. You know, you can't trust someone that you don't know very well. You don't know their character. That's why I'm saying you need to have an intimate relationship with the Lord. And all of the children of Israel had an opportunity to know God. They saw the works of God. We know they could have known God because we see how Joshua and Caleb responded. They said, if God is for us, if God is with us, then we are well able to take this land. We are well able. If God is for you, and the Bible tells us in Romans 8, he's for you and he's not against you. If God is for you, and if he is with you, and the Bible says he will never leave you or forsake you. If God is for you, and he is with you, that's all you need. You have enough to trust him. Trust him. I could tell so many instances of how God came through for Pastor and I over the last 45 years when we trusted him. And there was times that I felt like that I was leaning over that banister and nothing was holding me up except the promises of God. And if he let me down, I would die. Or we would go broke. Or different situations. But God is a God you can trust. Now I have a couple of, um, I, I'm leaving out a lot because I'm running out of time, but uh, Proverbs, uh, the third chapter. 
verse 5. So lean on, trust in, and be confident in the Lord with all your heart and your mind. And do not rely on your own insight or understanding. In all your ways, know, recognize, and acknowledge him, and he will direct and make straight and plain your paths. Go back to the, uh, that verse just before that. Lean on, trust in, and be confident in the Lord with all your heart and your mind. We need to get our mind totally renewed by the word of God to know the character of God. And we got to, our own understanding and insight can be so very much flawed. What does the word say? Uh, let's look at Isaiah 26, verse 3. You will guard and keep him in perfect and constant peace, whose mind, both its inclination and its character. So, I'm going to stop there for just a minute. Is your inclination and the character of your mind to automatically trust God when you face a situation? That's the question. If you don't have that inclination and that character, then you're not going to experience perfect peace in your life. So you will guard and keep him in perfect peace and constant uh, keep him in perfect and constant peace, whose mind, both its inclination and its character, is stayed on you because you, he commits himself to you. He leans on you and hopes confidently in you. That's what God wants for every one of us. I don't know what you're going through. I know where we're at as a church. We're facing the Jordan River. We're getting ready to pass over. And we're going to have to trust God. No murmuring or complaining. Trust God. A scripture um, that I want to end with, Hebrews 3.12. This is what God would say to each one of us. Therefore, beware, brethren and sistren. Take care, lest there be in any one of you a wicked, unbelieving heart which refuses to cling to to trust in and rely on him. Leading you to turn away, desert, or stand aloof from the living God. How many people have moved away from God because they don't trust him anymore? There's a lot of reasons why people don't trust God. Maybe you've experienced some disappointment with God. And you don't feel like you can trust him anymore. I can tell you that God is faithful. I like something that um, the Bible says in um, Hebrews 11:11 11, 11, about Sarah. He could, she considered God who had given her the promise to be reliable and trustworthy and true to his word. She considered God to be trustworthy. And I like uh, what the TPT says. She tapped into his faithfulness. God wants to show himself faithful in all of our lives. He delights in showing himself faithful in our lives. And that night, when I prayed in the basement, I found out that faith is not just a set of principles. Faith is a relationship. And that 
it's not just a matter of works, how well we work or how many times we pray or how many times we go to church and all those are important. It's not works, but it's a matter of trust. Trusting in God. This is a simple message. I just want to stir you up today to let you know that God is faithful and to remind you that true trust is leaning your whole personality over on God. Leaning on God. Depending on God. For everything that you do. For every breath that you breathe. Depending on God. And I can guarantee you, if you will do that, he will carry you through. Stand with me. Now, I don't know if uh, what you're going through. But I have a sense that there are people here this morning that have. Uh, you're facing some situations. That you've done all you know to do. You've, you've done what you know to do. And it hasn't worked out yet. So you keep trying. You keep worrying. And sometimes we worry God through prayer. You know, we, we pray and then we keep praying. Well, we just got to keep praying some more. Just keep praying some more. Keep. There comes a time... When we have to roll our whole personality over in the Lord and begin to praise God and thank Him that it's a done deal. Abraham did that in Romans 4. Said he considered him faithful and he stood strong in faith, giving glory to God. How do you stay strong? You trust God and you give him glory. And you praise him and you rejoice. So I don't know what's going on in your life, but I do know that God is faithful and that if you will trust him, he will bring you through. There's, there's healings that's going to come in your life if you trust God for healing. There's some finances that's going to come in your life. And there's going to be some relationships that are going to change. And I like what Dean said. You know, there's seed time, seed, and then there's time, and then there's harvest. There's faith, and sometimes there's time and patience, and then there's the answer. And all that time between when you start believing till you see it, there's a trust issue there that sometimes we have to deal with. A trust issue. I raise a hallelujah